You guys ready for something exciting that we don't know what's going to happen? All right, this is going to be the day. This is going to be one of the most unusual experiences ever. But that's okay. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you come together to worship with us at Hartford City Church. Uh, we're very excited about what God is doing here and praying for what God is doing in our community and our lives as well. And I just want us to take a moment and just kind of set our hearts uh, towards the Lord this morning. Uh, to prepare us for worship. Um, uh, as we worship the Lord, um, this is an opportunity for us to connect with God. And uh, we realize that people come from all different places and spaces, and we encourage you uh, to worship as you feel led. Uh, we encourage you that if for some reason you're, you're not familiar with any of it, you just let the Spirit of God you know, soak into you and just open yourself up uh, to the presence of God. I believe that anyone from the person who's the most disbelieving and doubting to the person who's the most devout. They would simply say, God, I'm open to you. God would lead you in the place where you're at this morning. So would you join me in prayer as we begin? God, we thank you for this space this morning. We thank you for your goodness in our lives. We thank you for blessings that are really too many for us to count. Forgive us for failing to see your goodness. Uh, forgive us for being so small-minded when we serve and worship such a mighty God. God, we pray that you would help us this morning, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that our praises and our worships might be lifted up to you, that this veil between uh, the spiritual realm and our realm will be opened, that we may access the very presence of God that is always with us. God, I pray that everyone here today would receive a blessing from you, would receive a word from you. Lord, and I pray that you would just bind our hearts together this morning. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together, to listen, to talk to each other, to, to be friends with each other, to say, uh, to share the elements of communion together. Lord God, we thank you for all of these opportunities that you have given to us, Lord. I pray that you would help us now to just set aside the cares and concerns that we bring in with us. Lord, I pray that you help us just to clear our minds, take a deep breath, and just in these next few moments together, in this short hour that we have, God truly be able to experience and be present to everything that you want for us and to everything that you are, Lord God. Lord, we lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. And I invite you, if you're able to stand, and let us worship the Lord together.
We are just beginning to grow by God's grace. And the offerings and tithes that we give, they help us to grow. They go to pay for the things that, that we have to do to put this on. Um, my salary, the rent here, our outreaches, the food that we serve, all of that. But we believe in what Paul says in the New Testament, that if anyone gives, they should do whatever they've decided in their heart to give. And do it cheerfully, not out of obligation. So there's no obligation at all. We trust that God will always provide for all of our finances. So it's just an opportunity for you to give. After the offering is passed every week, the pots go back into the four corners of the room. And we do that because if you want to put in a prayer request or anything else later on, like you didn't have enough time while I'm talking here and trying to stall to give you time to write out your prayer request, you can put it at the end of the service. Or if you'd rather give your offering at the end of the service, or even at the beginning, you can do that as well. Okay? So I'm going to say a prayer for our offering. And again, uh, then we'll collect it. Um, and then we'll uh, continue on with our worship. Lord Jesus, we do thank you because up to this point, you have provided wonderfully and miraculously for all that we can do. And we continue to trust your provision, not only for the church, but our own lives as well. So bless this offering, Lord. Multiply it that we may be used to glorify your name and to bless the city of Hartford. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless everyone who can give and everyone who can't give this morning, Lord God. And Lord, we do pray that we would become more of a praying community, that we would share our requests with one another so that we may lift each other up in prayer and truly see your hand at work in all of our lives. And Lord, we give this offering this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's take the offering. the offering is going around. Uh, my name is Joyce. I'm a pastoral staff team here at Hartford City Church. And uh, Jesus, yeah, we want to be like you. We want to be like you here, and we want to be like you in the community that our church is in. So on May 14th, we have this really great opportunity to practice some of the values of our church. At Hartford City Church, we want to love all, we want to serve all, and we want to welcome all. And so serving all means that we really want to be, uh, we want to really partner with um, community organizations that are trying to serve and revitalize the community. So May 14th, we have a cleanup day, a uh, staff night cleanup day. Um, in Hartford, there are um, these, these areas called neighborhood revitalization zones. And so in, uh, on May, uh, on, in Maple Avenue, which is like a couple blocks down the road, there's a Maple Ave NRZ. And on May 14th, they're hosting a cleanup day from 9 to 12 noon, and there's lunch served afterwards. And this is a great way that the community engagement team at Hartford City just wants you all to participate with us. So if you're with family and you have kids, or you're a college student that you know, your school is just up the road, like come join us. We live in Hartford. Come join the community. Um, we really want to make a difference and serve and yeah, revitalize the city, um, not just yeah, in very practical ways. Um, this is also a fantastic way for us to build relationships with people who live uh, around here. Um, if you're not, if you don't live here, this is a great way to build relationships and trust with our neighbors. It's a great way to love people. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if you want to be a part of this, um, feel free to take a picture of this. If you have this in your phone, you can let, let me know after service um, if you're interested. And um, yeah, I would love to see you there. I'll let you be there. Um, great. So, at this time, I'm going to say a prayer for us before Phil comes to speak. Um, so would you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for Sunday. We give you thanks that we are here to worship you. Uh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be with Phil, God. May his words be your words. God, would you open up our hearts, open up our ears to hear from you, God. Uh, we want to respond to you. We want to know and love you more. And we want to be like you in all of our lives, uh, personally, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. We want to be more like you as a church. So God, would you speak your words? Would they cut to our heart? Would we respond? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, this Sunday we are working our way um, from Easter to Pentecost. Um, Easter is when we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead. And then some uh, few weeks later, on Pentecost Sunday, May 15th, uh, we celebrate that Jesus um, sent the Holy Spirit, as he promised, and it fell upon the church. And it was really their first service, their first preview service, their first opening was Pentecost Sunday. And we celebrate that as the birthday of the church. Uh, one of the ways we want to celebrate is by offering baptism. We feel it's a great Sunday uh, to be baptized. Baptism symbolizes that you have new life in Christ that you're willing to allow your old life to die and receive the new life of Christ. It's new birth, it's a fresh start, it's the cleansing of sins. It's a wonderful demonstration of that. So we're gonna have baptisms here, we're gonna have some kind of take outside, hopefully the weather's good, and we're gonna baptize some people. 
And we have four people signed up already. We're really excited about that. But I believe there's more. So, so once again, I want to express my deep concern for you. First salvation is done. How come you have not been baptized? Because I never got around to it, okay? I don't know why you always have to be judging me. Because I only believe in science. Tonight, we are going to the next second thing. And I just thought you were going to do it Before he ascended into heaven. And it's the last story that John records. And um, what I want to do is I sort of walk us through the story. And sometimes uh, when I preach or talk, um, I explain it like this. I, I'm more like a like a tour guide. And that's what I want to be like this morning. I want to walk you through it and just kind of point out things that might be interesting. So there's there's several things that I want to point out. And something might grab your attention and you'll remember that more than another. And then as we move towards the end of the story, I believe that the story illustrates really well three things that we can use as excuses or, or mental blocks or reasons or, or, or maybe ideas why we can't follow Jesus, why we can't follow Jesus. And I think that the text, the story addresses each one of those. So it's found in John chapter 21. And of course, if you have an electronic Bible, you can open up and follow along if you want. Um, there is a free Bible app if anybody needs to know that. Uh, you can do it. We have our own uh, free Bible app up there in the corner today. If you need a hard copy Bible app, fill us handing out those Bible apps. You can raise your hand, and he'll make sure that you get one of those Bibles. Um, it'll be on the screen behind you as well, uh, coming up at different parts as I read. But I'm going to read parts of it and then just share parts of it with you this morning. Uh, but the entire story is found in the book of John, chapter 21. And again, we concluded last week, chapter 20, John said many more things could be written. But those things he wrote were so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. So it almost sounds like that was the end, right? I can almost imagine somebody was like, John, one more story. One more story, John, come on. John's like 90 years old around the campfire. They're like, come on, John, just one more story. And he's like, okay, there is another story that's really good. Let's put it in. You know, the Holy Spirit is inspiring me. Let's put this story in and let's see what it has to say to us today because it's so powerful. So afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus. You know, every time Thomas is mentioned, they say also known as Didymus. Isn't that just interesting? Why do they always have to say Thomas, also known as Didymus? It's like he went by another name with some people. They want to make sure it was that Thomas. Has anybody ever used a different name? Anybody ever done that? Oh, you have? You laugh. You must have used a different name. Sometimes people will use their middle names, right, for like a little while. My friend did that in junior high. Like for one year, the year I met him, he says, my name is Dean. And I was like, okay, so I knew it was Dean, but his real name was Clint. So everybody called him Clint. I was the only one calling him Dean. Well, the next year, he got so frustrated, he went back to Clint. And I, I only knew him as Dean. So I am the only person ever that still calls him Dean. And his name is Clint. It's confusing. But Thomas Didymus, it's an Aramaic name and a Greek name. So they always say Thomas and always Didymus. Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee. He's known by where he's from, right? Oh, yeah, he's from that place. Galilee, he's from King of Galilee. They, they rep he's representing, you know, where he's from. If you want to know, he's from that area. I don't know if that was good or bad back in the day. Who knows? The sons of Zebedee. Sometimes we're known by our parents, right? And that was James and John. They were actually, their father was a fisherman. They were fishing with him. Sons of Zebedee made the tackle. Maybe it was the name of their company. And Jesus comes by and he calls them. And they're known as the sons of Zebedee. And they were also called the sons of thunder. And people were like, well, that must mean they were kind of these boisterous, loud boys. No, they were the sons of thunder. Their dad was probably the big 
bad, you know what, how to say that word, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> he was the thunder, they were the sons of thunder, okay? So I love this, Simon Peter, Thomas, you know him as Didymus, Nathaniel, he's from Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. <laughs> <laughs> Who are those blokes? I don't know, they don't even get their name mentioned, you know? John's trying to read two, there were a couple other guys there, all right, all right, anyhow, let's get on with the story. John says, Simon Peter told them, I'm going out to fish. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Went out, a little nighttime fishing, right? Anybody ever gone out, a little nighttime fishing? On a lake, up in Maine, but you're quiet. You're out there, just the, just the sounds of the birds, and whatever. And fishing all night, nothing, man. Man, fishing all night, you get nothing. Nothing, 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 man. They must have been tired. Early in the morning, early in the morning, Jesus is standing on the shore. But once again, the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. It says later on, they're about 100 yards out. You know, they didn't necessarily see that well. It's the morning. They're tired. They've been fishing all night. Here's a guy standing on the shore. Like a lot of guys like to stand around, right? If you ever fishing, you know what I'm talking about. There's those who fish. And there's those who stand around and say, so did you catch anything? <laughs> no. And sometimes you have caught stuff and you say no anyhow because you don't want them getting your spot. You know what I'm saying? Not that you should do that, but sometimes you do that. Here's Jesus, right? What does he say? He said, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And Jesus said, well, why don't you put your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Yeah, I mean, just imagine. If it was any normal situation, you'd be like, what? <laughs> we're, what? We're fishermen. That's what we did for a living. We've been, we've been on the sea, this lake, our whole lives. We don't even know who you are. We can't recognize you. What are you telling us to throw our nets on the other side? It doesn't, he doesn't record any of their reactions. It just said that when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Amen. Wow. That's See, now you've got to get into this story. You've got to get into this for a minute. So for whatever reason, and I think something started to stir in the back of their minds. Something started to stir, because you see, when things are about to change in your life, they don't always change right away, but there comes a moment, there comes a point when something's about to change, and you just get a little sense of it, right? And something in the said, when he said, why don't you throw your nets on the other side? Why don't you do something different than what you've just been doing? Why don't you get simple? It may sound stupid to you. You may have already tried that side of the boat, but when Jesus comes and he says, I want you to try something different, would you do it? Yes. Would you do it? Not even knowing for sure if it was the voice of God, but something inside of you is stirring, something inside of you that you're like, you know what? I need to change because I've been out here all night and I got nothing. I got nothing. I am empty. There's nothing happening. I'm getting no production out of my job. I'm getting no production out of what used to be my, my enjoyment. I'm getting no production out of my hobby. I'm getting nothing. I'm trying. Even in our Christian lives, I'm not, I'm not seeing anybody coming to know the Lord. I'm not feeling any kind of, there's no fish. I got no fish. My nets are empty. The voice of God comes and says, why don't you try something else? Or why don't you try this again and see what happens? And there comes that point, right? We have to decide, okay, am I going to do this or not do this? And they put their nets down, and sure enough, they had so many fish, they couldn't even haul it in. They must have been thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, this happened before. Because it did. When Jesus first came to them, and they were still fishermen. And Peter was a fisherman. And the sons of Zebedee, James, and John were fishermen. And, and they were there by the Sea of Galilee. Jesus comes to them. And he stands in their boat because the crowds are coming. And he begins to teach them, right? And as he's teaching them, then he says, I want you to push out a little bit so we can teach them. And then he says, listen, I want you to throw your nets into the water. And that was another time where Peter said, look, we've been fishing this whole time. And we haven't caught anything. Peter just met Jesus. Didn't even know who he was, except that he had heard some stories about him. Here comes this famous teacher. Now he's standing in my boat. Now he's teaching the people. And now he's telling me, a fisherman, that I need to do how I can catch some fish. He must have been thinking, oh man, 
this is what happened before. When I first met Jesus, we put our nets down. And there was so much that we couldn't handle it. And that's what Jesus said. Why don't you come follow me? And I'll make you fishers of men. I mean, as he's on that, he must be thinking about that. Like, oh, this is what happened before. This is what happened. And then they realize it. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, remember that's John referring to himself. The reason we know that is later on in this chapter, he says that. He says, I'm that disciple. Okay? I don't know why he likes to talk in the third person. It's just his deal. He's an artist. Artists and creatives, they do what they do, all right? He's like, the, the disciples whom Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer, outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped in the water. And again, if he's thinking back over time, I don't know if he expected to walk on the water again or not. I, I doubt it. He probably just swam. It says it wasn't very far. The other disciples were towing this net full of fish. They were about 100 yards from shore. And when they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there. And some fish was already on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. And it says that they had a net full of large fish, 153. But even the net wasn't torn. And Jesus said, come and have breakfast. Yes. He gave them bread. And he gave them fish. And they had to think about that other story, right? Where there was no food. Just like their nets were empty. There was no provision. Just a little boy with five loaves of bread and two fish. And they fed 5,000 families. And Jesus said, come. I have some fish. You have some fish. Let's bring it together. Let's have breakfast. You know what's interesting is that Jesus didn't need their fish. Is that sinking in for anybody yet? Are you getting where I'm going with this? Because if we compare it to our lives, and we're looking at lives and saying, well, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. I'm not being productive. I don't see what's being produced in my life. Jesus doesn't need your production. I'm sorry. He doesn't need what you can do. He doesn't need your accomplishments. He doesn't need your titles. He doesn't need your successes. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your food. He doesn't need it. What he wants is you. Amen. All he wants is you. And he gives you the joy of working. He gives you the joy of bringing in those fish. But it's like, I've already got fish for you. And the good news of that for me, the good news is that either way we win. For if we were to pray, God, I need provision. God, I need provision. God will provide. And even if he doesn't, He's already got some for you on the shoulder. Amen? Even if he doesn't provide, he's already got it taken care of for you. One way or the other, you will win. You will receive what God wants. He will give it to you because he delights in you. But isn't that an excuse people use? A reason why I can't follow it? Because I don't have anything in my life. I don't have anything going on. Lord, I got nothing. I got nothing to bring. Oh, man, look at him. He can sing. She can dance. He's really good at talking to people. And man, look at him. You know, he's so good looking. He brings all the ladies in. I mean, everybody's got something <laughs> going on. And you're just like, what do I have? Oh, look, they're really, they're, they're a skilled athlete. Oh, look, man, they're a lawyer. They're a t- I mean, we're looking at, we're, and we look at ourselves and we say, God, I've got nothing. I don't know what I have. God, I've been trying all night, my whole life. And I just feel like I've got empty nets. Maybe Jesus is saying to you today, are you ready to try something different? Amen. Are you ready to go to the other side of the boat and see what happens? Don't get hung up if it's still empty. Because what I really want you to do is come to the shore and have breakfast. And I've got the fish already prepared for you. And I've got the bread. Let's sit down and have breakfast together. God has everything he needs and everything you need. And that's the good news. Right? Don't let your lack of provision keep you from serving God. Don't let your lack of what you have keep you from thinking that you're not important to God because you are. Because you are important to God whether your nets are empty or your nets are full. God wants you to come and he wants you to trust him that he will fill your nets. And until he fills your nets, he will also fill your needs with what he has prepared for you, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing comes from this interaction that happens next, which is just one of the most painful and beautiful stories in the entire Bible. Verse 15, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, 
Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know what? Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you want what's Peter think? Um, you asked me that already? Okay. He said, yes. Lord, you know that I love you. Then Jesus said, take care of my sheep. He was thinking, all right, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, I love them. Then the third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. But at that moment, he must have known what was going on, right? Because when Jesus was on trial for his life, his best friend Peter would not even go into the temple courts, but stayed outside. And when people came up to him while Jesus was being falsely accused and getting ready to die on the cross, People came up to Peter and said, aren't you one of his friends? Aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you one of those who is with him? And Peter denied even knowing Jesus. He betrayed Jesus, as we've talked about, as much as Judas betrayed Jesus. He turned his back on his friend. And Jesus told him he was going to do this. He said, you will do this. You will deny me three times before the rooster crows in the morning. And it was in the morning, at breakfast time, at daybreak, that the rooster crowed. And Peter realized, I have failed. I have failed, my Lord and Savior. And he went away, hurt and in despair. But he didn't choose the path of Judas. See, it's not that we fail. It's not that we mess up. It's like, what do we do with that, right? What do we do with that? Judas couldn't handle it, couldn't take it. Didn't believe in forgiveness of any kind of restoration. Saw no hope. He took his own life. He killed himself. Peter did not go that path. He went away hurt, upset, just as depressed as Judas. But when the word came that the tomb was empty, he was with the other disciples. He went to his friends instead. So when he was hurting, when he was alone, when he was feeling some kind of way, he went and stayed with the people that he knew he needed to be with. Judas went and tried to handle it on his own. And look what happened. Is that a word for somebody? Take it. That might be your word. I'm not playing around. Take it. It's how you handle that failure, right? So Peter was there. He saw Jesus when he appeared to them in the room. And then he's there when Jesus calls to him. And he jumps out of the boat and he swims to the shore. And he's like, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And he's all excited. And he's maybe even starting to forget about what happened. But then Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? A third time, do you love me? Peter's like, oh, yeah. He said, Lord, you know all things. That's powerful, isn't it? You know all things. Lord, you know my failures. You know my weaknesses. You know all the times I've messed up. You know me, Lord. You know all things. But you also, I love you. And Peter was restored. Peter was restored by the love of God. By his relationship with God. See, failure is never final. Failure never has the last word. It's what we do with our failures, right? And again, when people say that I've messed up too much, I can't follow Christ, I can't be a Christian, I can't come to church because I've messed up too much. No, the word is, yes, you can come because Jesus wants to love you and forgive you and restore you. Because it's about a relationship, right? It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about rituals. It's, not, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about someone saying, I love you from the beginning so that when you do mess up, you know somewhere in your mind there is a love that you can come back to. There is a love that will restore you. There is a love that will forgive you. And yes, it may hurt. And yes, you may suffer some consequences. But even in that hurt, I am loving you and I am restoring you and I am forgiving you so that you will be stronger than ever. Because, Peter, I got some things for you to do. You're going to lead. You're going to feed my sheep. In other words, you're going to lead my church. You're going to lead my people. You're going to pastor them. You're going to shepherd them. You're going to teach them, Peter. Peter, you're going to become one of the greatest human beings that's ever lived. Because I am not only loving you and restoring you, I'm giving you purpose in your life. But then he goes on to say, but, but, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself, you went where you wanted. When you were old, you 
will stretch out your hands, someone else will dress you, and lead you where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, like he did so many years ago when they first met him, follow me. Amen. Follow me. I'm telling you, what God has for you may not be pleasant. Uh -huh. It may not be what you want. You know what Jesus was telling him? There's going to come a day when you're going to be arrested. <laughs> we're going to stretch out your hands and be put in chains. And they're going to put prison clothes on you. And they're going to lead you out to be killed. And tradition says that, G that Peter was crucified upside down. Because he didn't want to be crucified like Jesus. But he was, he was crucified on a cross. He gave his life to glorify God. Sometimes what Jesus tells us, listen, isn't that pleasant, right? Are you still going to follow him? Are you still going to say, okay, I'll follow you. I'll trust your purpose. Even though it may be painful, even may not, not be exactly what I want. And then this interesting thing happens. He turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had leaned back against Jesus at supper and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he said, what about him? You tell me I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to die? Well, Dr. Well, what about this guy? Jesus says, basically, don't worry about him. <laughs> he says, um, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Right? So here's the third thing that keeps us from Christ. The first thing that keeps us from following God is thinking we don't have anything to give. We got no provisions. We got an answer. The second thing is we think we messed up too much. We messed up, we failed, we, we've done too many bad things. But we don't realize that God can forgive us can restore us and loves us. And the third thing is, we're always comparing ourselves to other people, aren't we? It's like, well, they seem close to God. Well, they seem to have that relationship with God. They seem to be, and I, I don't, why, what about, why can't my life be like them? Why can't my life be like that, right? And that constant comparing, not even in following Christ in life, right? That constant comparing just gets us nowhere. Because we're always comparing ourselves to some, and Jesus is basically saying, look, I got, you have your own story. And he has his own story. And she has his own story. And I told you, I'm pointing out lots of different things today, but some of you need to hear this. Stop comparing yourself to others. Stop wanting what someone else has. Stop, I mean, this is your story. It's yours. Nobody else has it. And you can't get nobody else's. And you won't always understand everybody else's story either. Okay? But God has, a, God has your story. He says, listen, this is what's going to happen for you, right? And I think sometimes we get stuck in our relationship with God because we feel like, well, I'm comparing it to somebody else. I'm comparing it to, the, to, that, to that leader or that person or that person. And I'm like, I don't have that. I would, what, about, what about God? What about me? Why can't I be like that person? God's like, don't worry about that person. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I will provide for you. I will give you everything you need, even more than you want. I want a relationship with you. Even when you mess up and fail, I want you to come back and I want you to be restored. And I have a plan for you that's going to bring you both joy and pain. And to follow Christ, I'm going to be real. I'm trying to keep it real for you guys. Try not to be just fancy or emotional or manipulative. Following Christ, you need to embrace joy and pain. And you need to learn how to do both. I'm going to be flat out honest. Too many of us do not know how to do that. We don't. All we want is joy. We just want to feel good. God wants me to be happy. Really? Your happiness is God's highest concern. Okay, that's an interesting thought. Does he want you to be filled with joy and have purpose? Yeah, of course. Does he want you to be loved? Yes, of course. But it doesn't mean that it's free from pain. How many of you know that it takes some pain to accomplish something? How many of you know that it takes some pain to heal sometimes? It takes some pain to get better. It takes some pain to get where you want to go. It takes some pain to get in shape. It takes some pain to accomplish what you want to accomplish, right? It takes some pain because people around you don't understand you. And people around you might be trying to put you down. And it takes pain because we do mess up. And we do stumble and we do fall. And it's hard to get back up. And it hurts our pride. And it's painful because sometimes the nets are empty and sometimes they're full. 
Stop complaining about the pain. Just say, all right, I'll take the pain. I'll take the pain. And some people, in a weird way, they have a hard time taking the joy, don't they? They somehow seem to live off their pain. Oh, I got problems. I live off my problems. I've always got problems, right? And they're like, everything's a drama. Everything's a new thing. And you're like, man, you're like addicted to the drama. You're like addicted to the problems, right? It's like, why do you love that pain so much? Because I just love the pain. I love to be the one in need. Everybody's going to help me, help me. Oh, my life. Wow. Don't you want some joy? You know, those friends, they're, 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 sometimes they're, I'm not talking about anybody here. There's nobody here, okay? These are people I used to know. They like to listen to depressing music or watch depressing movies and just be sad all the time. And I'd be like, man, I like you, but it's hard to be around. <laughs> Because you're sad all the time. Can't we laugh like once or twice? And yet people, people legitimately stuck in that place can't. They really, they really are like, man, it's dark. I can't see the joy. All God seems to have for me is pain. My good news is that that's not true. God does have joy for you. He has joy for you. He has joy for you. And when you can embrace the joy, when you can embrace the pain, and say, yes, Jesus, I will follow you so that my life may glorify you, so that I may proclaim who you are to a hurt and dying world. Yes, Lord, I will do it. I will learn to embrace the joy. I will learn to embrace the pain. And then verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and wrote them down. And we know that his testimony is true. So John finally reveals himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who leaned back against Jesus, the one who had the special place for Jesus, the one who didn't stay alive when Jesus returned, but Jesus said, if I wanted to, he will. He actually lived the longest, they think, of all the disciples. He was put into exile on an island that was kind of his prison. He was able to live out his life. Um, he had visions of the future. That he wrote down in the book of Revelations. So in a way, he did get to see Jesus return, but in a vision and in a prediction of the future. He lived a long, long time. And he was never associated with one place. He was always known as the one who traveled around. And they said that everywhere he went, he always seemed to have the same message. And it was about God's love. And if you read one of his other books, 1 John, you understand that. 1 John, he just keeps talking about God's love, God's love, God's love. And he was just kind of known for that. And then he says again at the end, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, because I know you guys keep wanting more stories, even the whole world would not have room for the books that could be written. And then the Gospel of John ends there. So the message this morning, friends, is simply this. Don't let your provision or lack of provision keep you from hearing the voice of Maybe if you're in a place where you're stuck, it's time to throw your net on the other side of the boat. That may mean something you've already tried and it didn't work, or it may mean something new. Amen? And I think maybe God, if that's you, I believe God is telling you that right now. I believe that right now you have this idea of what you need to do. How you can throw your net on the other side. Don't let your failures, friends, man, if, you, if you've messed up, if you failed, if you've really blown it, <laughs> This week, maybe two or three times, receive God's forgiveness today. When we come, when we celebrate communion in just a minute, just know that you all are invited to come. No matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done, you simply need to believe that Jesus is the Lord and that he's risen from the dead. And you will be saved and you can receive the elements this morning. As you come forward, receive God's forgiveness. Receive his cleansing. Say, God, forgive me, restore me. Maybe the Lord is saying to you this morning, do you love me? And he just wants you simply to hear you say, yes, Lord, I do love you. And he says, I love you too. Don't let that keep you from the Lord this morning. And finally, for someone, maybe as you've been comparing yourself to other people, you've been thinking about how your story is not like someone else's story. Ask God to set you free from that this morning. Ask God to help you be Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So that you can let their story be their story and your story be your story. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for the wisdom of your words, for the wisdom that comes through hearing these stories, Lord, and understanding more about ourselves and about you and who we are. Lord, I pray that you would in this moment just uh, seal what you're doing in our lives, God. I pray that the word that each person needs to hear, that you would just take it right now and just seal it in their heart and mind. Just give you the space to do that in the Lord, I thank you for your provision. Lord, I thank you for your forgiveness and restoration. Lord, I thank you that my story is my own. And Lord, help me to embrace the joy and the pain of following you for the rest of my life, however long you want my life to be, however you want my life to be. Lord, I pray that for myself, for my heart, and my life this morning. Pray this in Jesus' power and strong name. Amen. This morning we come to the communion table because Jesus was together with his friends on the night before he died. He said, Listen, I want to show you what this is all about. He took a piece of bread and broke it. He said, This is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, when they were done eating, he took the cup. He said, look, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. New arrangement, new agreement, forgiveness of sins. Because I love you. And I will love you forever. I want you to do this in remembrance of me whenever you come together. And so the church, from the earliest times, even as Jesus was resurrected, and he broke bread and gave it to them, they continued to break bread and take it, remembering what Jesus had done for them. Remembering this sacrifice. And today we pray that as we partake in these elements, that we might also be willing to sacrifice to give it all to the Lord this morning. That He may have it all in our lives. That's the song we'll be singing as we partake this morning. That the Lord would have it all. And if there's any part of your life that God is calling you to surrender, I invite you to do that. If you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that this morning. You simply need to say, yes, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I give you my life and I receive your life. Just say that right now in your heart and you can come forward and this could be your first communion as a Christian, as a follower of Christ today. You don't have to be a member of this church. You just have to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Danny, Derek, Skyler, and Tristan to come forward to be the servers for communion today. And then I will go ahead and pray for us before we take communion.
Jesus, we thank you for receiving our prayers, our hearts, our lives. I want to encourage you, if you've given your life to Christ, that you continue to follow him, continue to grow in grace and knowledge. And don't do it on your own. Get together with others. We can help you along the way. If you'd like any help this morning in knowing how to follow Jesus Christ, we'd be happy to talk to you after the service or you can contact me. And I encourage you again, if you've never been baptized, consider being baptized as a sign that you're willing to follow Jesus. And you can talk to me right after the service as well. I'd love to get your name on the list of those being baptized in two weeks. So Lord, as you have given to us your life, your body, Lord, we give you our lives, we give you our hearts. Lord, we ask that you might do with us as you will, that you would guide us, you would lead us. We know that whatever may come, through the joy and through the pain, you are with us every step of the way. And I thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for everything that you give us, for your love and forgiveness, and that you have a story that's just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 As you go this morning from this place, I want to tell you just a couple of things. Um, there is a, um, a little booklet like this called A Night with Fire. I want to invite everyone to take one this morning. Uh, this is the annual story of our conference of churches all throughout New England and the Mid-Atlantic and what God is doing. Um, they support us in a big way. They send us um, a lot of financial resources for the first three years of our existence. And so I wanted us to be able to hear what's going on and to celebrate uh, what God is doing in our conference. I was just at a meeting um, where they said um, eight years ago they set a goal that they would plant a new church every other year. Well, the last two years, uh, we've been planting um, six churches a year. So it's been an amazing growth to see what happens. I would like to take one of these and just read it and celebrate it. Know about uh, those larger groups that support us and that help us to be able to be here this morning. And as always, we have a wonderful lunch that is free for everyone that is here. We have uh, pasta salad and kabasi and a couple other good things as well. Uh, so we invite you just to go outside, make a right, and go down to the next building, which is the cafeteria. Okay, I guess we have a video, so. I told you. Go ahead, have, go, ahead, go ahead and have a seat. And we'll, uh, <laughs>
All right, so thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right, everyone stand. Receive the benediction. Now let's go and enjoy some food together. As we go forth from this place, I pray, I pray boldly, knowing that God does whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, but knowing who he is, I pray that you may find that your nets are full, that you're forgiven and restored, and that you begin to understand the next chapter of the story that God is writing in your life, that we may all together glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Sure. Oh, so glad you're here. Let's go. 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 Let's go.